If you have your Bible, open up to uh, Leviticus 23. My goal today is to wrap up the series on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and get moving forward in the feasts here. So we're going to pick up chapter 23, verse 26. Now we've spent a couple weeks looking at this. We've gone through the process as laid out by God in Leviticus chapter 16. And we've seen how very specific God was for the Day of Atonement and the process that needed to be, to be followed so that um, nobody would offend God. Okay, um, We've talked about the fact that this is the, the day for national atonement. It was not a day for personal atonement. Uh, you had the ten days of repentance from the Feast of Trumpets to the Feast of Atonement. If, if you were not prepared, if you had not repented, if you had rebellion and sin in your life, this would not take that out. You had to do that personally. You were responsible for that. Okay? So we're going to pick up in verse 26. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, shall you keep your Sabbath. All right? So, last week, if you remember at the end of the message, I challenged you to, to take a look at Melchizedek. Okay? I, I challenged you to look into Genesis and see about his interaction with Abraham. And, and then I challenged you to jump all the way forward into Hebrews and to see what the author of Hebrews had to say about Melchizedek. And today we're actually going to, we're going to spend most of the day in Hebrews. Okay, so if you have your Bible, flip over to Hebrews chapter 4. That's where we're going to start. Um, you know, I, before I really got into this study, I knew that um, <clears throat> Hebrews dealt with things that the Jewish people would understand. That's why it's called Hebrews. And it's not called the book of Gentiles. Um, but when I started digging into this, and I started looking at uh, just what the author is trying to do, you know, we have such a, a bizarre, egocentric thinking, okay? I, I'm not saying we do this intentionally, but <clears throat> if you've ever been around a child, um, we had all of the, almost all of our grandkids over yesterday, and we were outside, we were, we were playing what we, we very loosely termed as soccer. It was more just kind of push each other and hope you can kick the ball. And the grandkids were playing. <clears throat> and uh, there was a dispute that broke out amongst the grandkids. And um, they were going back and forth about, you know, how to play the game. And, and we were trying to, to get the I idea across that in soccer, um, you don't share with everybody. Which is absolutely, completely contrary to everything we've taught them up to this point in their lives. Say, so, no, you can't just, you, you know, the, the ball would come to them, they'd pick them up and walk it over and, and you do it. Oh, you can't do that. Okay? And, and we talked about how that was just so bizarre a uh, teaching. You know, we're trying to teach them to, to share because of their own disposition, kids don't share. Mine. Mine. Uh, you know, that's one of the first three words that a child will say. Mine. 
okay? And, and so when you're trying to teach a child um, to share, you're trying to teach them to not be egocentric because to a child, the entire world revolves around them. I mean, you think about it from the aspect of a toddler. Mom and dad clothe me. Mom and dad feed me. Mom and dad take care of me. Everything is about me. It's just like a cat. <laughs> Everything is about me. And, and then you've got to try and teach them to break this thinking and go, no, it's not all about you. And then you have a second child. That's why firstborn children tend to be so messed up. <laughs> They're like, hey, what is this? And then the second child, you know, they, they start to teach them and they kind of have to learn to share pretty quick because older sibling make sure they share. If mom and dad aren't paying attention, second child is going to share everything. All right? Um, <clears throat> we were youth pastors at a church in Oklahoma. And Christopher and Donovan, um, Benjamin was just born, so Christopher would have been probably between four and five, and Donovan would have been just before three. <clears throat> and we, we had this situation that was ongoing, where for whatever reason, Donovan would start crying. And we'd go, uh, Christopher, what's going on? And Christopher would go, I don't know. Mr. Innocent. <coughs> He just started crying. Well, you know, as an adult, there's usually a reason that kids cry, especially when they're alone with another sibling. <laughs> and so one day we were doing something outside of the nursery and they were playing with toys in the nursery and Donovan got upset and he started crying and, and Christy walked in and w went to go settle down and she asked Christopher, he said, what happened? And Donovan said, Kiffer hit me. And Christopher went, oh, he's starting to talk. <laughs> okay, so, so Donovan had to learn very early on to communicate because his life was at risk. All right, but see, there's this whole mentality of an egocentric thinking that, that we have to get outside of. And in the, in the, you know, we tend to look at the church as we see it here in America. And as a result of that, we a lot of times misunderstand Scripture because we're not dealing with the culture in which it was written. We're not dealing with what was going on in the world in the time that it was written. We're oftentimes not even in the place that the particular people it was written to were in. Okay, so a lot of times we take our broad brush American culture thinking and we slap it across Scripture instead of taking the broad brush of Scripture and slapping it over our American culture. Okay, and we try and interpret scripture in light of our culture. Well, Hebrews is writing to the Jews about stuff that we as Christians never really had to go through. We never really had to deal with. Because we were born outside of the law. We were not given the law, unless, unless somebody here is Jewish. Um, you know, you were raised Jewish and, and you were under the law. So a lot of what's going on here, we don't really pick up. Now, I want to highlight some, some key verses in this. We're really going to move fast. Um, if you would like a copy of my notes afterward, please come talk to me. I'll get you a copy. I did not get the uh, PowerPoint done. 1.30 this morning, I'm laying in bed thinking. And I know you're thinking, why in the world are you thinking at 1.30 in the morning? I was thinking, why am I thinking at 1.30 in the morning? And all of a sudden, this light bulb went off in my head. I didn't do the PowerPoint. And I'm sorry for you guys, but I wasn't going to get up at 1.30 and do it. So there's no PowerPoint today. But we're going to hit a lot of scriptures, okay? Because we're going to work through a number of chapters in Hebrews. I'm going to pull out some, some scriptures. I want to show you some things. Because the writer of Hebrews is writing to the Jews. And the context in which he is writing deals very specifically with atonement. Okay? So, Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 14 through 16. I'm going to hit these real quick. Uh, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is, this is one of my favorite passages. Okay? Because this tells me that Jesus, Jesus gets it. He understands what I'm going through. Okay? But in the context of uh, the Hebrew teaching, okay, he's, he's laying out a foundation here. Because what the author of Hebrews is, is trying to get across is that our sacrifice, our priest, our altar is better than what Moses gave. Now, we don't really understand the significance of that remark because we weren't raised to almost deify Moses. Okay? In the Jewish thinking, man, if it came from the mouth of Moses, it came from the mouth of God, and, and boy, that was like the pinnacle. The problem was they set themselves in a, a particular pattern of thinking that required that anything outside of that thinking be discarded. That's why when Jesus came, so many of the Jews could not accept him because they had already established in, in the law and the prophets how the Messiah was going to appear when he appeared and, and, and they had discarded the other things about the Messiah that didn't fit with that. He was going to come as a mighty king. He was going to come on that white horse. He was going to cast down the Romans and kick them out. And he was going to raise, he was going to elevate Israel back up to primacy. And, and here he comes on a donkey. You can't be him. Uh-uh. So what we're going to see is as, as we go through Hebrews, the, the author is trying to lay out this foundation based on the scripture and based on these two comparisons. And we'll see between Melchizedek and the Aaronic priesthoods that Jesus is a better priest, and he has something better to offer us. So we see right here, he calls Jesus a great high priest. Now you notice he passed through the heavens. Okay? Aaron didn't pass through the heavens. Okay? He is in heaven at this point, but he didn't come from heaven. He didn't pass through heaven to come to us. Um, so let us hold fast to our confession. Uh, our high priest is able to sympathize with our weakness. He has been tempted in every respect as we are. Now I know there are temptations that, that I am subject to that don't affect Christy. There are temptations that Christy is subject to that I look at and I go, why is that even an issue? Why does that bother you? You know, um, but Jesus can sympathize with both of our temptations. All right? So, because he is able to sympathize with us, we can go before him knowing he's been there. That's an encouragement for us to draw close to him. All right? Let's jump down a little bit further. We're going to uh, chapter 5. I'm just going to hit a few key verses here. Um, 1 through 4, uh, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward because he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sin, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when he is called by God, just as Aaron was. Now see, he's laying out this corollary. Remember we worked through Leviticus 16, when the high priest came for the Day of Atonement, what was the first thing he had to do? He washed himself. He put on the garments for that day, and then he had to take a bull and sacrifice it for his sin and his family. Okay? He, see right here, he says, um, <clears throat> because, of his, because of this, what? The, the um, suffering, the, the temptation, the struggle of, of, of sin. He says, because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sin. <coughs> and then just as he does for the people. So remember, there's the bull that goes in, that's his sacrifice, and then the goat that was chosen for God, that's the sacrifice for the people. Okay, see the, see the correlation? Because we're not Jews and we don't celebrate the Feast of Atonement, that we've not grown up in that, we read this and we just kind of, you know, there are times when, you know, you read a passage and, and your brain goes, ee! and then you get to a part that you like and you think you understand and then it just kind of kicks back in. All right. 
we have to get this thinking. This is why we spent so much time in the Hebrew Scriptures. Because without understanding those, we cannot fully grasp what is being taught to us as the church in the New Testament. Okay? So, here we see the, the corollary. He's talking about the Feast of Atonement, the sacrifice for the high priest, and then the sacrifice for the people. And then he says, and no one takes this honor for himself, but only when he is called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, I want you to understand as we go through this, I am in no way trying to diminish Aaron or the Aaronic priesthood. I am in no way seeking to uh, besmirch them or to make them less. God called Aaron. God appointed Aaron. God chose that priesthood for a time. Um, and, and they were there to serve at God's will. Okay? So w as we go through this, keep that in mind. Because as I'm saying these things, anybody, even Aaron as high priest, when compared to Jesus Christ, is going to come up short. Okay, so when, when I'm talking about these things, I don't want you to think I'm looking down my nose at Aaron. By no means am I doing that, okay? Um, because quite honestly, you know, when, when Aaron's sons died by presenting strange fire, you know, it was Aaron that, that told Moses, he said, hey, hey, look, man, I, I'm, I'm not looking to offend God. I'm not looking to, to, to follow in the sin. He said, I, I want God to be glorified. And, and for a man to do that, when, when all of your natural instinct would be to be mad at God and upset with God, because, hey, he just took my two oldest children. Aaron had an insight and an understanding that a lot of times we miss because we're so caught up in Moses. All right? So, so God appointed Aaron. There are a couple things I want to point out to you. One, the priest must be a man. Two, he must fulfill and function the office of priest. Three, he has to be compassionate. He has to be sympathetic. He has to come into this with the understanding that just because God called him to serve in this position does not elevate him above the people. He's still caught in his sin. He still needs a sacrifice. He still needs atonement made for him. Okay? Four, the priest is called of God. Okay? So we're going to jump down real quick. Uh, verses 5 through 10. Uh, so also Christ did not exalt himself. See the correlation being married, being uh, carried out here. He's, he's laying these. He's juxtapositioning Jesus and the, the high priest of the Aaronic priesthood. He's laying them out side by side. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. But was appointed by him who said to him. Now, pay attention here. Because everything rests on this verse. Okay? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so there's, there's two things being laid out here. First we see the, the, the calling of Christ being from God. Okay, so he's called just like the, the priests were. But then he goes further and he says... Um, God didn't just call him to be priest. He, he sent him as a son. Okay? The, 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 the child, the son of God, has come to fulfill the office. Well, immediately right there, there's a problem. Because Jesus was born of what tribe? Yeah. Judah. Judah. Okay? What tribe did the priests come from? Levi. Levi. So, how can Jesus, being born of Judah... Fulfill the office of priest if that office is going to be fulfilled through the Levites. And specifically through the family of Aaron in the Levites. Well, because God in his wisdom puts no scripture in place on accident. There's always a plan. So he comes down to this verse in 6. He says, uh, and he also says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So... Hold on to those two thoughts. One, he's a priest forever. And two, in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Not Aaron. Melchizedek. Okay? In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, 
He learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So right here in this little couple of verses, the author lays out his entire premise for why everything from here on out is better. Okay? Jesus was called as God's son. He suffered because God called him to suffer. And because he suffered and, and was obedient even to death on the cross, he is now a priest of the order of Melchizedek. And we go, okay, but what does that even mean? Okay, the order of Melchizedek. Well, let's take a look a little bit further down, and we're going to see some, some correlations and some things that are uh, explained. Flip over to chapter 7 real quick here. Well, I don't care. You can turn slow. You don't have to turn quick. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 4 through 10. I'm not going to get it done today. We're not even close. Um, all right. Chapter 7, verse 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. Now, the, the, right before this, we see that, uh, well, let's just read it. I'm, I'm not going to get it all done today, so I'm just going to take my time. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. Okay, so we go back in our, our history in Genesis. Uh, Lot has been carried off, and, and Abraham finds out, and he gathers up, gathers up 400 of his men, and they take off, and they catch the, the people that the Midianites had, had taken uh, Lot and his family, and, and with 400 men, he completely, well, no, it wasn't with 400 men. It was with the Spirit of God. He destroys the enemy. He routes the enemy. He not only gains back Lot and his family and, and all of their stuff and their flocks and their herds, but he also gets all the other stuff that the, the Midianites had as well. And on his way back home, we have this weird little incursion with this, this little parenthetical happening where he runs into Melchizedek, who is called the King of Salem but he's also called high priest. So you want to keep those two things in mind. One, Melchizedek is a king, and two, he is a priest unto God. Okay. Now, look at the uh, correlation here, and, and some things should jump out at you really quick. Um, first, uh, he is the king of righteousness, and two, he is the king of peace. Now, do you remember the prophecy in Isaiah? For unto you this day will be born one who is called... Prince of Peace. Remember that? You see the corollary here? Um, king, Jesus is going to be called the King of Kings. He is the King of Kings, but on that day, everyone will acknowledge him. He is without father or mother or genealogy. Now, this is not to say that Melchizedek was not human. What this is saying is that according to our records, we have no identification of who his mom or dad were. We don't know who any of his relatives were. He just appeared on the scene as king and high priest. Okay? Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now you see, the author is painting this, this parallel. And he's holding up Jesus... And then he's looking at Melchizedek and he's superimposing him over so that we can see how the two... Remember, I, I've, I've said often that nothing in the Old Testament is there without its fulfillment, its furthering, or its completion in the New Testament. Okay, And that's what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He's saying, hey, look, this is the Jesus I'm proclaiming to you. He's of the order of Melchizedek. And he's laying Melchizedek over so that we can see the perfect fit. Okay? So that we can see the fulfillment of the prophecies. Uh, Psalm 110, verse 4, what we just read. Um, you know, I have called you a high priest forever, a priest forever of the order of Melchizedek. Now, um, let's, let's go a little bit further in this. 
uh, but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. Okay, now it's interesting in this because normally when you make a, a um, connection, a comparison, um, you usually compare the, the immediate to the other. Well, he's, he's actually reversing this, but even though Melchizedek came thousands of years before, he's comparing Melchizedek, he's saying he's, he's like the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. In this presentation, the way he's saying this, he's letting us know that Jesus is, is superior even to Melchizedek. Okay? If you look at the order that this is written in, he's saying, you know, Melchizedek, he has neither father nor mother nor genealogy. Uh, he has neither beginning nor end, just like the Son of God. Okay? He, he's like Jesus. All right? So let's go down a little bit further. Um, see how this man to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. Okay, this is where we get our tithe. Okay, this is where tithe was birthed. Not in Hebrews, in Genesis. Okay, this is a principle. We've talked about that when we went through our, our series on finances. Okay, um, so, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from the brothers, though, uh, though these also are descended from Abraham. Okay, we're going back to the Mosaic Law. The Levites were set out. The Aaronic priesthood was, was chosen out of the Levites. The people of Israel were to bring their tithes to the house of God. And, and the Levites, and specifically the priests, were to receive those tithes. Okay? So even though they're children of Abraham, just like all the others, God has appointed them to receive the tithes. All right? Um, but this man, who does not have his descent from them... Melchizedek is not descended from the patriarchs, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Okay? So he's laying out this correlation. You really got to fix these anchor points in your mind of what he's trying to, to paint a picture of. He's very clearly laying out to the Jews. They, they don't even blink at this because they understand, okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the priests, they're chosen, they're just like everybody else, but God chose them out, they receive the tithes and the offerings. And now he's saying, but Melchizedek, even though he's not of the line of Abraham, the father of the patriarchs paid tithes to him. Okay? And then Melchizedek blessed him. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Okay? That means when, when you're going to bless someone, it doesn't go up, it comes down. Now, we, we say, you'll hear me often in my prayers, I say, uh, we bless you. Uh, I'm not saying that in that we have anything to offer God. I'm saying that in that he's, he is worthy of everything we have and more. All that we have, we, we give to him. Okay? But when somebody blesses, it comes downhill, not uphill. Okay? So when Melchizedek blesses Abraham, he's saying that Abraham is the less in these two, two people. Okay? Now, for a Jew, that is like, <coughs> what? Can you believe he's, what? He lays out his argument. The superior blesses the inferior. Well, you can't argue with that. So then he goes on and he says, uh, in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. Melchizedek is receiving the tithes. Verse 9, one might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. <coughs> we don't have a really good understanding of the Jewish thinking, the Eastern thinking, about lineage, okay? Um, in these things, you know, Scripture says that God will punish under the third and the fourth generation. Okay, we also see that that in the new covenant, uh, He doesn't treat the children for their father's sins, nor the fathers for their children's sins. I'm really glad for that because I don't want my kids' sins. I, I got trouble enough with my own. Okay, but we don't understand how. Things pass from one to the other. And that even though Levi was not yet born, he was going to be born. He was just in waiting. And so the author, very understandable, the Jewish thinking says, hey, you know, Levi, even though he wasn't born, he paid the tithes because he was still in his father. 
We go, okay, that's just kind of weird. But to Eastern thinking, oh, that makes sense. Yes, because because he's the he, they're connected. Okay, so um, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, verse eleven. I'm going to wrap up in this little portion right here. Um, verse eleven. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise from the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So he, he's presenting a question for his argument here. Okay, if, if the order of Aaron and, and the Aaronic priesthood was sufficient, why did God say that there was going to be need for another one? Okay, Remember, um, we talked about last week a, a couple of passages and said forever. The statute will be forever. Um, that forever in the, in the Hebrew is not the same forever that we understand. We look at forever and we say that's eternity. It's never going to end. Forever in the Hebrew word actually means for a set time. Okay? For a set time. Now, that time can be great or less, but it's, it's a set time. Okay? And what he's presenting right here is, hey man, if, if the Aaronic priesthood was sufficient, why did God say that there was going to be more? There was going to be another one. Why was he going to have to go somewhere else? Um, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one to whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Okay? Guys, I, you really got to understand how significant what he's saying here is. Because it was through Moses that the law came. It was through Moses, but Moses being the conduit, God being the voice that he spoke through Moses, and, and Moses told the people, it was through Moses that the Aaronic priesthood was established under the law. The law regulated how they were to deal with the people. It regulated how the people were to deal with them. This was God's will. This is, this is written in stone. But not forever. Okay? And so he says, for where there is a change in the priesthood, if we're going to take it out of the tribe of Levi and we're going to put it anywhere else, the law has to change as well. It can't stay the same because the law says it belongs here. Do you see what he's setting up? He's laying all of these bricks as a foundation. Okay? He's saying, all right, you know, there's a, God said that Melchizedek, there's going to be another one of the order of Melchizedek. All right? Let's start with that. That's our cornerstone. And then he's going to lay out, hey, look, if, if the Aaronic priesthood was sufficient, why would we even need the cornerstone? There would be no need for the cornerstone, and my argument's done. All right? And then he says, with, with, okay, the law came in and it appointed Aaron as the priest and Aaron's descendants as the priests and the tribe of Levi to serve on behalf of the priests. There, here's another brick. If, if Melchizedek, if the line has got to go to Melchizedek, then the law on which the Aaronic priesthood stands has to be changed. Another brick in this foundation. He's setting this thing up so that we can see how God had promised Israel... <clears throat> And promised us that there was going to be something better. There was going to be a new covenant. I will take away their hearts of stone. And I will give them hearts of flesh. And then later he says, and I will write my commandments on it. He's going to put them here. And he says, there's, there's going to come a time when, when there's going to be something that supersedes the law. Jesus, Jesus, one of the first things that he said, he said, hey, I have not come to abolish the law. I, I've not come to get rid of it. I've come to fulfill it. And once it's fulfilled, there's something better. All right, so hold on to these things. I'm going to encourage you again. Um, we're in chapter 7. We just got down to um, verse 14. Okay? Start right there and keep reading ahead. Okay? Read it a couple times. Because next week we're going to see how the, the author is continuing to build his argument brick by brick as to why Jesus is superior than Aaron and even Moses and even the angels. Okay? And then we're going to tie this all back around 
See, all of these things are done through the atonement, the Feast of Atonement, and we're going to tie all of this back around because if the feasts are prophetic, which we know the spring feasts are, which indicates that the fall feasts are, there's got to be some in indication as to how it's going to be fulfilled. And we're going to bring that all back around and see why the Feast of Atonement <coughs> is given such primacy and how that applies in the future, how that prophecy could be fulfilled. I, I'm even confident enough to say it's most likely going to be fulfilled. Okay? But I don't ever want to be one of those people that says it's got to be done this way or it's not God. And there's a lot of Jews fell because of that. All right? I want to be one of those that says this is the way I think it's going to happen but God, your will be done. Okay? In spite of me. Amen? Mm -hmm.